bequest, once again, is general in nature. It confers a general benefit, but it's payable from a specific source. It's a hybrid of those two things. So, again, for example, in the case of a demonstrative bequest, let's say I leave you $10,000 payable from XYZ Corporation stock. And it turns out that at my death, I own some XYZ Corporation stock. And I leave you $10,000 payable from that. If the stock is worth $20,000, you'll take $10,000. Just that general bequest. If the stock is worth $5,000, my executor will sell the $5,000 worth of stock. Then he'll have to find $5,000 more dollars to get you up to 10, from another source to get you up to $10,000. Okay? You're going to take $10,000 primarily from that source. If that source isn't around, he'll have to find out some other place to get that $10,000. So you see how it's like a general bequest. It confers a general benefit on you, but it's payable from a specific source, so it's kind of a hybrid. Question about that. That's a hard one to see. The only question I think I've ever asked on a demonstrative bequest is maybe if I'm giving you some short definitions, I might ask you what a demonstrative bequest is. Demonstrative bequest is. We will refer to it a couple of times in the course of this chapter this week, but rarely, just in practice, they're rare. You just don't see them come up in practice very often. You see specific bequests all the time, general bequests all the time, and residuary bequests all the time, but in real life, in fact, you rarely see a demonstrative bequest. But theoretically, we need to classify them because there are times when the applications of these rules are not going to apply, and they may apply specific rules or special rules to demonstrative bequests. Question about demonstrative bequests. Yeah? What's the purpose of classifying it as a demonstrative bequest? We're going to see. We're going to see. I can't tell you now because if I tell you, I can't tell you. If I don't give you one, then I'm going to spoil the surprise. I've got to have something up my sleeve. Nothing up my sleeve? Look, it's Haley's Comet. No. We'll talk about it. There's really just, in all honesty, you're Ms. Johnson, right? Okay, Ms. Johnson. In all honesty, it's going to be rare. It's going to be rare, but there is going to be at least one doctrine where, that we cover in this chapter this week, where you're going to have to know that it's a demonstrative bequest. But I don't want to tell you yet. Fair question, but let me see. Other questions I don't want to answer. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Yeah? Going once? Going twice? Going thrice? 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 Okay. Let's talk about, so what's a residuary bequest or a residuary device or a residuary legacy? Using those terms interchangeably. Device, legacy, bequest. Those are gifts and a will of real or personal property. What's a residuary? It's everything else. It's everything that's not a specific device, a general device, that rare demonstrative device that just admittedly does not come up too often. Everything else is the residuary estate, a residuary gift, a residuary device, a residuary legacy, a residuary bequest. Like every house that's remaining in the testator's estate after specific general demonstrative bequests have been paid. Everything else. And usually there is the tip-off to the fact that it's a residuary device. The will will say something like, and I leave all the rest and residue of my estate or the rest and residue of my property. Something like that. Similar words to that. All the rest of my estate. Usually it will have the word residue, residuary. But it may not. All the rest of my estate. All the rest of my property goes to blank. Texas A&M, my beloved alma mater, whatever it might be. My girlfriend Lolita. My favorite nephew. Whatever it might be. Everything else. And Professor Byer points out, and this is true, the residuary device might be fairly unimportant. The most important thing that the testator might be disposing of are things that might be specific items in general amounts, general bequests. Maybe demonstrative, but that's rare. And it may be just whatever's left over, whatever I haven't given already, specific or general bequests, I give to blank. Or it may be the most important thing in the estate. It might be the whole estate. If I have no specific general or demonstrative bequests, if I die with a will saying I leave my entire estate to my beloved wife, I haven't made any specific general demonstrative bequests, my entire estate is a residuary. 
And again, you're going to see why we need to classify these kinds of gifts made in the will in certain ways because there are several doctrines in this, in this chapter that we have to apply depending on how we they apply to some of these and not to other ones. So that's why um, we're going to have to classify it more than that. I won't say at this point. Uh, okay. Finally, questions about any of that? So questions about specific, general, demonstrative, or residual requests. You can figure out what those things are. Some of you look uncomfortable. Let's stop. Questions? You want some more examples? Some more examples? Okay. Let's have examples. Mr. Navarro? If you have... Well, is this a question or you're answering examples? Down, down here, these people want more examples. Can you give some examples? Or? Yeah, it's kind of an example. Okay, it's kind of an example. All right, let's see. You leave $10,000 in the safe disguised as a Diet Coke can in the freezer. Is that a, is that a specific gift? Ooh, because that's a... That's a, that's a good question. I would say that's still a general request, but it may depend. It may depend, and to get back to Ms. Johnson's very good question, that is, it may depend on what doctrine it is we're classifying, what doctrine are we trying to apply. So I'm going to hold off on that. I suspect that's a general request. So give me something back. Give me an example of a general request. Give me an easy example. I give you $10,000. $10,000. $100,000. $1,000,000. What if I leave you a $1,000,000 in my estate? And I am insolvent at my death. What will they do? Right, we're going to talk about abatement. That's one of the reasons why I have to classify these things. Right, I'll leave you ten million dollars. If I'm bankrupt, you won't get anything. It's just that simple. So you know, maybe my creditors will, maybe they won't. Right. So a general bequest is usually an amount of money. It might be something else that's very readily liquid and transferable, uh, transferable into money, um, like a stock. I leave you a thousand shares of General Motors Corporation. If I don't own a thousand shares of General Motors Corporation at my death, my um, my uh, executive will have to go out and buy a thousand shares and give you the thousand <coughs> shares. But still, that's something that would be convertible. That's liquid. That'd be convertible into money. So it'd be much more like if I left you ten thousand dollars. A specific request, on the other hand, is a, a specifically identifiable asset, and it's all those things that we talked about. But it could also be, I leave you my stock certificate number 1 million, uh, which is for 10,000 shares of General Motors Corporation. Well, now, that's not a general bequest. That is a specific, here's the specific top stock certificate with all my General Motors shares, and that's going to you. That's a specific item. Again, and Ms. Johnson had a great question. That is, why do we have to, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, by, by, you asked a very good question. And, and I said I wasn't going to answer it. Now I'm kind of going back on it and answering it just a little bit. Why would it matter if I left you a thousand shares of General Motors Corporation, general request, or my one thousand shares of General Motors Corporation that's in a certain such and such account, or my one thousand shares that's on? I don't think people even have stock certificates anymore. I think they're all, all held in street name. But assuming that it's it's a specific certificate of General Motors Corporation, that's a specific item. There may be a reason why we need to classify those things, starting with the redemption doctrine. What if I leave you a thousand shares of General Motors, or my one thousand shares of General Motors, and when I die, I become General Motors Corporation shares in my estate? That's why we have to classify these things. And sometimes it's not so easy to see the difference between a general bequest and a specific bequest, especially if it has to do with something like stock. Generally, what, generally, the general rule is that wills are a great question. Let's get classified. You may have to see what exactly what the will says, right? But the general rule is that a will is what's called an ambulatory document. We can change it. If I'm a testator, I can change it at any time until I die. So generally, the rule is the, we, the will speaks as of the death of the deceased, the death of the testator. Generally, that's when we, and you're going to see most of these default rules, most of the um, rules in this chapter. Or we will look at the time testator dies for these things, and then apply these rules. That's generally the rule. There's some exceptions to that general rule. Okay, good question. Yes? Question, or you're, you're, just, you're just hanging on every word. Bless you, bless you. So. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, other questions? 
All right, let's um, let's 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 move onward, upward, and talk about some other things. Oh, notice um, notes two and notes three on pages one thirty nine and one forty. A gift can also be classified based on the identity of the beneficiary. It can be a private individual or a group of individuals, or it could be a charitable entity. So it's private, a private gift, a private device in a will, or a charitable device in a will. And why might that matter? And in note three, Professor Fire tells you why that might matter, and I don't really want to go into it in great length, but in chapter 123 of the property code, if the gift, the device in the will, is a charitable device, it's going to a charitable entity, the Attorney General of the State of Texas is the necessary party to any proceeding involving that charitable gift of the uncontested probate. And the Attorney General has to receive notice of that. If the Attorney General doesn't get notice of that proceeding involving that charitable gift, that gift, or any proceeding, that proceeding is void. Start over again. It's voidable. The Attorney General can it's not void, it's voidable. The Attorney General can void it and you can start over again because the Attorney General and can you think why would that be? Can you think why an Attorney General might be a necessary party to any proceeding, any contest involving a charitable gift? Who has an interest in that? Well, I think that's fair, yeah, everyone, right? I mean it's so the public has an interest in seeing the charitable bequests are carried out. Okay? And the Attorney General, as the representative of the public, is the necessary party. And that's what the, um, the, the policy behind that rule, and that's what the legislature decided. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Now, let's talk, if there are no more questions about that, let's talk about redemption. The doctrine of redemption, sometimes called redemption by extinction. First, this is the first set of rules that uh, we have to classify gifts to uh, in order to apply the rule, right? Addemption applies only to specific bequests. So if we can classify a gift um, that might be the subject of redemption as something other than a specific bequest, redemption won't apply. It applies to specific bequests or devices or legacies. Okay. And it's a rule of construction, not a rule of law. That is, it's a default rule that applies when the will doesn't say otherwise. That is, when the will is silent. And it can be drafted around. The testator can draft around it. But it applies if the will is silent in order to carry out what is presumed to be the testator's intentions. And this is so true of so many of these doctrines that we are going to be examining for the next <laughs> the rest, the rest of the semester. These rules apply. We've even, we've even, even seen some of them, I think, already. We're going to start to see a lot of them. Rules apply to carry out what is presumed to be testator's intentions. Who's doing the presuming? Who's doing the presuming? Well, the legislature, if it's in the statute, if it's not in the statute, who's doing the presuming? The courts by common law, absolutely. These are either common law rules and exemptions of common law rules, you're going to see, or um, and some of these rules are statutory rules. Mr. Smith, you said this uh, that this can be drafted around. Is that going to be a conflict with the CDP direction? Yeah, a lot. Of, most of these rules are rules of construction. They apply when the will is silent, and they can be drafted. Yeah. Most of them. Yes, that is very common. Other good questions. Pretty bad question. Okay. All right. Yeah, no one's going to. Oh, I thought a bad question. All right. Um, here's how a damage applies. You've got a specific request. Remember, it is a specific device. This is a specifically identifiable item in testator's estate. It's going to an individual, a group of individuals. Okay? Specific request. If that item is not in testator's estate at testator's death, because the, the, the will generally, the general rule is the will speak at the death of testator. We keep the exception. That's the general rule. If that item the testator had, presumably when testator wrote the will, the will's effective at testator's death. That specific item is not in testator's estate, and that beneficiary or those beneficiaries don't take anything. The gift to the dean is taken away, and they get nothing. They don't get money that's, that's equivalent to it. They don't get proceeds from it. They get nothing. 
So, but it only applies to specific requests. So, if a disappointed beneficiary, the item's gone, but if the disappointed beneficiary can challenge the will or that distribution in the will and can get a court, and this is court, this is really a general request, or a monthly request, or a literary request, or something other than a specific request, they'll take it. But if it's a specific request and it's not there, specific gift and it's not there, they can't convince the court to recategorize it, they won't take it. And that's what these cases and problems are all about. The um, Carter case gives us, um, let's see, a better definition. On page 142, middle of the page, definition of the term ademption. Page 142 of your case book. You probably have this marked already. The term ademption is involved here and is used to describe, here it is, the act by which a specific legacy, a specific gift, a gift that's classified, a device that's classified as a specific gift in a will, becomes inoperative. It's taken away because of the disappearance of the subject matter, that is, the disappearance of that item, the subject of that gift, from the testator's estate in the testator's lifetime. The general rule is that a specific legacy is a deem, taken away, disappears, if the thing given in the, in the will is disposed of by the testator during the testator's life. That's it. That's the ademption rule and how we're going to go through cases and we'll go through problems and we're going to see um, how it applies in a number of cases. Okay. Uh, so, ademption applies only to specific devices and only where the will is silent about whether device E is to take something else if that specific item isn't in testator's estate at testator's death. I can draft it around. I, as testator, I can say, I give you my diamond ring. But if, if, if we know what diamond ring we're talking about, we can identify it. Maybe I have five diamond rings, and now we'll have to take extrinsic evidence to see which one it is. But the diamond ring that I, I, I think he gave, the, the virus gave the example, right? The diamond ring that I had, my grandfather's diamond ring that has his initials on it. Okay, that, we know what that is. And if I don't have that, if I give that to you in my will, and I've disposed of it during my lifetime, you don't take anything. But I could draft around that redemption rule. I could say, I give you my that diamond ring. However, if it's not in my estate, I leave you an amount equivalent to the value of the diamond ring on my death. I leave you $1,000, I leave you $5,000, whatever it might be. Then we draft it around redemption. The ring's gone. It's not, you know, if I dispose of the ring, it's gone. I'm not going to be able to get it back from a bona fide purchases or anything like that. But I can draft around the ademption doctrine by giving you something in substitution for it. But if I don't, then you just take that. You don't get the ring, you don't get anything. That's what ademption does. And that's the issue in the Rogers case, isn't it? What was or were the devices at issue in Rogers? What was it that the father left? To his children. He left them six tracts of land. He left, them, he left them an interest in real property, six tracts of land. And when he drafted his will, he had an undivided interest one half interest in some of the property and one third interest in some of the other property. And he left this to his children. Specifically, I leave one half interest in these properties to, to my children, I leave a one third interest in these, in these other properties to my children. And in fact, that's what he owned at the time he drafted the will. Years later, as of the time of his death, this is the general rule, he didn't own all those pieces of property. In fact, I think it was down to maybe two of them, as I recall, and he owned 100% interest in those two. Not, I think those were two of the ones that he only left a third to his children. He owned 100% in those two, and he owned 0% in the other two. So the children said, okay, um, this gift really hasn't a dean, and we should take 100% interest in these two properties. And the widow of the testator, who was their stepmother, not, not their mother, their stepmother, right? Uh, so you can see a tension there. I'm not to say wicked stepmother. I'm just going to say stepmother because she might have been a lovely person. The kids might have been greedy. I don't know what the situation is. But I can't tell you how many cases we have. <coughs> We've seen one or two already. I think we'll see several cases between now and the end of the year where the um, stepmother and uh, she's the widow of, of the testator um, and surviving children, or stepfather, uh, and, and surviving children of the testator, but stepchildren of the, of the 
widow or widow. Uh, and that's what we've got here. She says, no, no, no. Dad said, my husband said, a one-third interest in those two properties, that's all they take, a one-third interest in those two properties. By the way, she takes she takes the rest under the will, right? So she says, they take a one-third interest in those two properties, and the other five properties that are gone, specific items, specifically specific gifts, specifically identifiable pieces of property, those five that are gone have all of been. So all the children take is their share of a one-third interest in these two properties, not their share of 100% of these two properties. And the court agreed with them. The gift hit a deed. Is that what testator intended? No, why not? That is clearly not what testator intended. Why not? How do we know that? How are we told that? I think in this case, the stepmother was wicked. I think that that is not, clearly not what testator intended. Why do we know that? What evidence would have been introduced at trial if the trial court said you can't introduce it? The sole evidence will be talking more about and about that when you get to your own interpretation. What did the court say? Who was ready to testify that that's not what testator intended? The testator, in fact, that when testator went through this series of transactions to get from an, an undivided partial interest in seven pieces of property to a 100% interest in two pieces of property, he wanted his kids, he meant for his kids to take from these properties whatever interest he had, all of it, not just a third of it in these two. The attorney who, dra who, who drafted the will, right, was ready to say, was ready to testify, the testator told me this is what he wanted. And he couldn't testify because we have like a parole evidence rule. The, the, the will was clear and unambiguous on its face. We can't introduce attorney's evidence or anyone's evidence to vary the plain meaning, the clear and unambiguous meaning of the will. We'll see if there's, if there's a new, narrow exception to that, but I don't think the court decided that. Probably couldn't decide that. Okay, so we can't do it. So the court said these were specific requests of an interest in seven pieces of property. Two pieces of property were left. The other five pieces of property, those gifts of Dean, they were specific requests. Um, what were the children's arguments that, in fact, the exemption doctrine did not apply here? What were their legal arguments as to why this wasn't a specific request or why there should be an exception? In this case, parties introduced exceptions to the exemption doctrine. And there are exceptions. What is it? What were some of the... Right. You know, this is really a demonstrative bequest, right? He wanted us to have property from a specific source, and it's really a demonstrative bequest. And what did the court say about that? Um, they're not. <laughs> no, they didn't give us much analysis, right? But they just said they're not demonstrative bequests. This, again, goes back to the fact that you don't see demonstrative bequests very much as a practical matter. But if the court had agreed that they were demonstrative bequests, then the children could have taken 100% of these two properties because exemption doesn't apply to demonstrative bequests. Dad also could have drafted around it in his will. I want my children to take to split my undivided interest in these seven properties, or if I no longer have these proceeds or whatever properties I have in substitution for those things. He could have done that, but he didn't do that. Okay? Um, they had one other um, reason why exemption didn't apply here, and this is an important exception. It's a one way exemption won't apply if the will is silent. It won't apply if we can classify this gift as something other than a specific request. It says exemption won't apply. Another exception to the exemption doctrine is what? Voluntary partition. Well, they were talking about there was a voluntary partition, and really, there were, there were it, it took like years for these transactions to occur. They went back and forth between members of the family, so that he ended up instead of with, with an undivided interest in seven pieces of property, he, he had a 100% interest in two pieces of property. It was a voluntary partition, but more just like exchange, the value of exchange. Yeah, yeah. And because this, there has been an exchange, one of the exceptions is the item has changed in form, in form only. It's only been a change in form. Really, as a practical matter, they're saying, yes, Dad wanted us to have whatever interest he took, he had in these properties at his death. How do we know that? Because his attorney would have testified. The attorney was, was 
because Mark can testify to that. To that. Um, and, and to that end, Dad made partitions and went back and forth and changed it really in form only. He still had two of these seven pieces of property, but instead of owning an undivided interest in them, he owned a 100% interest in two of them rather than undivided in seven of them. That really is just a change in form. There's no hard, fast rule for that. You're just going to have to be, make the best argument to see if you can convince the court that it's a change in form only. It's pretty rare. I'm going to give you an example um, after this case when I think there's a change in form only. It's going to be pretty rare. But if a court will classify the gift or the situation, will say that this really, the item has changed form only, not from real property to its proceeds, but maybe not from one piece of real property to another piece of real property, but change form only, how might that be? Hold that for thought for a little while. The court will say that then exemption won't apply. But they didn't they wouldn't let them reclassify it as a demonstrative bequest. They rejected the claim that this was a change in form only. It was a specific bequest. Therefore, they took exactly what they said in the will. One third interest in the two pieces of property that he had left, the other five pieces of property, I mean, they take nothing. And of course, their beloved stepmother takes all the rest and residue of that. Um, let's see what else I want to say about this. Um, okay, that's probably, that's probably all that I want to say about this. Question about this one before we get to the Finer's Hospital case, which has a specific kind of, um, well, it's, it's a similar kind of specific quest. It's a slightly different situation. All right, let's look at the Shriner's case on page 140. Steiner's Hospital for Crippled Children of Texas versus Stahl. Um, again, this is an ademption issue. What was it that Testator wanted, or at least what did she say in her will that she wanted her um, nieces and nephews? What did she want her nieces and nephews to say? What was the specific item, the specific quest? My home place. That was a term she was <coughs> my home place, right? It was her homestead, basically. Okay. Family home, her home. My home place I leave to my nieces and nephews. 103 acre home place. Okay. And um, what happened was shortly before her death, she sold her home place um, and got a note for eighty thousand dollars and took back a mortgage deed trust and then was going to secure repayment of that. In other words, let's just say she sold it for eighty thousand dollars, but not cash. It was on credit, so it was a note. So that was identifiable. So here's what her nieces and nephews said. Okay, she wanted us to have the home place. She sold it for eighty thousand dollars. She had a note representing the eighty thousand dollars debt to her. Please give us the note, and then, then the buyers will just pay us. We'll get the we'll get the eighty thousand dollars proceeds plus interest. So who was claiming that there was redemption? In this case, yeah, the hospital. The, the, the residuary estate was was for some charities, right? So the question is, does this does this eighty thousand dollar note does it go to the? Is it change in form only, so that it goes to the nieces and nephews, or has the gift redeemed, and now it's part of the residuary estate that goes to the charities rather than the nieces and nephews? And the court held that redemption applied in this case. The gift has redeemed because she sold her land, she voluntarily disposed of her land before her death. And um, look on some rules here that I want to, um, Ms. Jones, there's a rule here that I want you to, uh, that I want all of us to see, not just you, I want all of us to see, bottom page 145, look at the rule, as in a contrary intention expressed in the will, the alienation or disappearance of the subject matter of a specific request from the test agent's estate would deem the device of the quest. That's the rule. We know that. That's the exemption rule. A will speaks of the time of testator's death, and that's the general rule. It doesn't have to be that way. It depends on the interpretation. That's the general rule. It is the estate that the testator then possessed that passes according to the terms of the will. She didn't have her home place. She had sold it before she died. Therefore, it was a specific, specifically identifiable item, specific request, the gift as a deem been taken away, and in fact, these people, the nieces and nephews, take it up. Now, the court notes, bottom of 145 and top of 146, some exceptions. 
we've already talked about some of the exceptions. Exception number one, testator can draft around this provision by making it clear what her intention was in her will. I'll leave my home place to my nieces and nephews. However, if I've sold the home place, they will take the proceeds of that sale. Or they will take an amount equivalent to the value of it, whatever it is. Or they'll take a, a set $10,000 in substitution for it. She can draft around exemptions if she wants to. But she didn't do it here. Most of the time, testators don't. Don't do that. So that's one exception, right? Um, another exception, as the court tells us at the top of page 146, an involuntary disposition. The rule doesn't apply. Exemption doesn't apply. Think about it. Exemption applies to carry out testators' presumed intention. But if the disposition was involuntary, if there was a foreclosure, if testator became mentally incapacitated and testator's guardian of the estate sold the property, that wasn't a voluntary disposition by testator. That wasn't testator's intention necessarily that that thing be gone and the beneficiaries take nothing. So if there's an involuntary disposition of the item during testator's lifetime, then exemption doesn't apply. The court's going to have to decide, well, how much was that worth and where is it going to come from? But these people will take an, an, an equivalent gift. The gift will not have a deed. They can't take that specific item. That's gone. But the gift will not, exemption will not apply. But, so that's what happened in this case. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward case. Exemption applies. She said, my home place. She disposed of my home place. The proceeds are identifiable because it's an $80,000 note. It's not merely a change in form, is it? It went from real property to personal property. That change in form, courts are pretty um, stingy about what they uh, are pretty restrictive and read change in form narrowly. Therefore, I don't think it's going to be a change in form. It's rare. I'll give you an example in a moment of a change in form. Arguably, a change in form only. But it's not a change in form. It's not an involuntary disposition. She didn't go nuts and, and, and her guardian had the guardian the estate appointed who sold her property. She didn't lose her mind or anything like that. She sold it. I want to take that home. She could have drafted around it, and she didn't draft it. Okay. Those are the main things that I want you to take away. There is also the question is, did that pass by partial intestacy, or did it lapse and fall into a residuary estate? And the courts say there's always, you, you see, the case stands for the fact that there's always constructional preference for testate disposition, full testate disposition of testator's estate, as opposed to a partial intestacy. The, the thinking is the testator goes to the trouble of making a will, and testator presumably didn't want any of testator's estate to pass by intestacy. And it was clear. The testator made it clear that testator did want that. Um, okay, notes afterwards. Page 147. Um, no one. What is redemption by extinction? Into what classification of testimony or gifts does it apply? I think we know that. I hope we know that. I spent a few minutes on that one. I think note five. I've got a note in my notes that we've also talked about note five. Gifts to deemed to court will not allow the intended beneficiaries to receive the equivalent value. Note five on page 148. Via tracing or otherwise, what policy supports this rule? We've talked about it. The idea is that it's a default rule. It can be drafted around it. If testator doesn't draft around it, it's applied to carry out testator's presumed intention. I give you a specific item, leave you a specific item in my will, but I've disposed of it before I die. Unless I say something else in my will, the presumption is I don't want you to change my mind. I don't want you to take it. I'm selling it or I'm giving it to someone else, and it's not there for you to take unless I've said something different in my will or unless we can say it's a change in form or whatever, unless we can say that it's a different type of gift or it's really a specific um, uh, device or request. Um, Notes two and three. The cases in notes two and three. Um, my note is I think the cases are correctly decided. They may seem harsh, but given the adaptation doctrine, which seems like a fairly harsh doctrine, I think it was harsh in in both of these cases. But that's that's the rule, and we're, we're, we're stuck with it. So given the adaptation doctrine as the default rule, which applies unless testator specifies otherwise in the will, in notes two and three, um, those cases came out correctly. Now look at note four, and I want to talk about note four, because um, note four shows a case where the exemption doctrine applies along with the doctrine of equitable conversion. I think we could have done the same kind of thing in the, um, in the, the Shriners Hospital case. The same kind of thing could have happened. She could have signed a contract to sell her property and then died while the contract was pending. 
And you know if the contract is specifically enforceable, if, if I'm leaving something to you and I die, while the contract, but I'm, uh, I'm selling it to Professor Spurlock, and we have contract on it, and it's a specifically enforceable contract, all the contingencies have been removed, then equitable conversion has applied. And what is the doctrine of equitable conversion? You know, we didn't, stop, we didn't talk about it. We just want to see if you remember. Because maybe in December you'll see it again in some form or fashion. So what's the doctrine of equitable conversion? That's our Joe Spurlock and I. This room is Black Acre. I signed a contract with him to sell Black Acre to him. He's going to buy Black Acre. And I die while that contract's pending. And in my will, I leave Black Acre to you. What's the doctrine of equitable conversion? The legal title hasn't passed, we're going to treat it as a equitable That's right. The legal title hasn't passed, we're going to treat it as equity is going to, equitable conversion of title. Equity is going to treat it, the title has converted to Joe Spurlock. He is going to be treated as the owner in equity, and I, a dead person in my estate, actually, is going to be treated as having bare legal title, the right to receive the proceeds. And proceeds are personal property, not real property. So if I leave Black Acre to you, and I die, an enforceable contract pending that Black Acre is going to be sold to someone else, in this case Joe Spurlock, then my estate has the right to receive the proceeds and you don't pay Black Acre. That's just my will of silence. The gift to the dean and whoever has the right to receive my proceeds, my residuary beneficiary, my general legacies, they'll take that amount that Joe Spurlock is going to pay me his debt. And that could have happened. That's what happened in note four, the Matt Ledge versus Matt Ledge case. And it could have happened in the uh, Triner Hospital case as well. It didn't because she actually went through it. Yeah, she, she sold her property before she died. The, the sale had closed before she died. So the sale had been pending. Equitable conversion might have applied as it does in that court. But just this would seem like the uh, the principal tracing would not apply. That's right. The principal tracing doesn't apply. So a couple days later, it was equitable conversion. Conversion goes through the owner. It doesn't apply because of the true title. Because of the that's exactly right. The only time it might apply, you might have to trace it, is if the court says, well, there's an exception to the redemption doctrine here for one of these other reasons. Then you then you trace those proceeds and they go if to you get the court. You can get the court to do that. Exactly. And it doesn't happen very often. Um, okay. Um, by the way, notice, look at the sample will. Let's look and see what it says about redemption. Look on page 471 of your case book. You can run the sample will. I'm going to We've looked at the sample will a couple of times, and now we'll be looking at the sample will fairly frequently to see what, if anything, it provides on some of the documents. Look at um, page 471, Article 4A, 4A, Specific Gifts. Look at what it says. I leave my blank. Describe the item. Do blank the beneficiary. Now, look at what it says about exemption. If that beneficiary does not survive me, I leave my item to the alternate beneficiary. If the item, well, that, that's, that's the alternate, that survives. Sorry about that. Now, look at the, the third sentence of 4 A. If the item is not in my estate, then the redemption uh, construction. Then, too bad, so sad, beneficiary. Or then, I want my beneficiaries to take the proceeds or the value of that or to take a, a certain amount of money instead of that. Okay, now we're dressed around redemption. So that I want you to just see Professor Beyer in this sample will form has at least thought about, has, has had you, the attorney, think about what you're going to tell your client about redemption. Gee, I know you want your home place, ma'am, to go to your nieces and nephews. But what if you sell it before you die? Oh, I never thought about that. Then I don't want them to take anything, right? That's the default rule for redemption. Or then, gee, I'd like them to split $100,000, or I'd like them to have the proceeds. Fine, let's put it in your will to draft around the redemption doctrine. You know, you can serve your client's interests better, carry out your client's <coughs> intent, intentions better uh, by knowing how this applies. Um, okay, let's look at note six. What are some of the possible exceptions to a strict application of the redemption doctrine? All right, we've already talked about this. The first one is you can draft around it. The will makes it clear that redemption will not apply and something else will, the beneficiary will take something else instead of the item that's not in the estate, then listen to the will. Okay. And we also see another exception or purported exception 
if the gift can fairly be classified as something other than a specific request, if it's general, demonstrative, or residual, then exemption won't apply. We've seen another one, a third one, if the gift, if the item has been involuntarily parted with by the testator, right? It's not a voluntary disposition, then exemption doesn't apply. And I'm going to come back to an example of that in a moment. And finally, exception number four, if the item, the specifically devised item, has changed form only, merely a change in form and not a change in substance. I'm going to give you an example of that. All right, so you see four exceptions. One, if the will drafts around it. Two, if it is, if it can be classified as another kind of gift other than a specific request. Three, if the disposition was involuntary. And number four, if it is a change, this is the number, this is, this is the other one, a change in form only, not in substance. Now, let me give you examples. So we're going to work through a couple of slides. So, for example, an example of an involuntary disposition, we've talked about this, foreclosure. So, I leave you Black Acre, which is mortgaged to the hilt. Okay? Black Acre gets foreclosed on. I owe $100,000. It gets foreclosed on, and it's a foreclosure sale because it's a valuable piece of property that brings $120,000. There's $20,000 in excess proceeds. First $100,000 goes to pay off my debt. The $20,000 in excess proceeds comes back to my estate. Where does that $20,000 go? Does it go to the residuary divisee, or do you take the $20,000 you to a place here black acre? The only thing is going to you, right? And it is, because exemption doesn't apply. It's an exception that's been a foreclosure sale that's been an involuntary disposition. Now, not all states think that. Some states think that, that foreclosure is actually voluntary, because I could have paid or figured out a way to pay the, um, the, the, the mortgage. I, my story, and I'm sticking to it, and if it comes up on the final exam, I can't remember the last time I asked about, um, uh, about foreclosure specifically as an exception to exemption, but my explanation is that it's an involuntary disposition. So to the extent there are excess proceeds, obviously, if Black Acre is um, foreclosed on and there's just nothing left in the estate, well, you can't take anything. But if there's some excess proceeds that are identifiable, you would certainly take the excess proceeds. No question about that. I think question is what else you might take beyond the excess proceeds. Um, how about, yeah, the other thing is if Black Acre is disposed of, say I leave Black Acre to you, and I get old and infirm and can't take care of myself, I'm declared incapacitated, and a guardian of the estate is appointed, and the first thing the guardian of the estate does is sell Black Acre. And let's say we can trace those assets. That's the only asset of my estate. Black Acre is worth a million dollars, and the, the, the uh, guardian sells it for a million dollars, and then I promptly and conveniently die with $999,999 left in my estate. Arguably, I think you should take the entire proceeds because there isn't an exemption because the guardian of the estate, that wasn't a voluntary disposition by me, that was a disposition by my guardian for my benefit. I didn't voluntarily part with it, so you can't have it. That's not what I intended. Remember, it applies to carry out testator's presumed intention. Okay. Um, a casualty loss. Let me give you an example of a casualty loss. Suppose I have the valuable collection I use as pre-Columbian pottery. Okay? I specifically leave it to you in my will. My pre-Columbian collection. Specific item. We know what it is. Now, the will speaks at the time of my death, so I might be buying and selling these things up until the time I die. But once I die, my collection is set as of the time of my death. We know what it is, and you're going to take it if it's still in my estate at my death. But suppose my collection right before I die is destroyed in a fire, and I collect a million dollars insurance proceeds. I've insured it as a result of the loss. Then I die with that million dollars still in my account. What do you take? A will is silent. Does exemption apply or not? Is that involuntary disposition? Do you take the million dollar proceeds that we can trace to the casualty loss? Or do you take nothing? You might be able to argue that's a change in form. Okay. I mean, 
I, I think it's a tougher argument because, gosh darn, it was specific little, little items, Bush. hard items, and now it's money. But, but you might be able to make an argument that it's a change in form on it. You might. Sure, you would. It's a practical matter. Of course, you might. Right? Change in form only. What about involuntary disposition? I didn't just destroy by fire. I didn't. I didn't burn it down. I didn't voluntarily part with it so you don't take it at my death. I think you get the million dollars. You might get it under change in form only. I think you're more likely to get it to say if it wasn't voluntarily parted with. And now we have specific proceeds that we can trace, and you can take those proceeds. However, what if when I die? Columbia collection was not in my estate. No explanation. We don't know where it is. It's just gone. It's not in my estate. We don't know. Can't find any proceeds traceable to it. We don't. We don't know where it is. What result? My will is silent. What do you think? Zero. I think that's right. I think it's in supply, right? Yeah. I mean, I think you would have to prove that it was involuntary disposition. And if we can't show why or why, you know, if you can't show why it's in the estate, uh, why it's not in the estate at my death. The presumption would probably arise that I, the testator, disposed of it during my lifetime with the intent, voluntarily with the intent to not take it. Okay? Unless my will said something different. Um, now, what if, because I can hear you thinking this one, let's combine those two. Let's suppose I say in my will, my pre Columbian art collection, either. shortly before I die, it's destroyed in a fire, involuntary disposition. But it's not insured, and there are no proceeds traceable to it. What's the result? I don't know the answer to that. Do you, do you take, if, if my estate, if it was worth a million dollars and my estate has a million dollars in the residuary, is the residuary bequest abated and that million dollars go to you? Or is it just too bad, so sad because I didn't insure it? There's no change in form only, there's nothing there to replace it. <laughs> but but it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't voluntarily parted with unless I burned it down, right? So I don't know the answer to that one. I think there's a good argument that redemption doesn't apply, but I'm not sure what what you're going to take instead. Maybe maybe redemption should apply. After all, I could have insured it if I wanted to. I didn't insure it. I ran the risk of loss. But the loss happened. I don't get to enjoy it during my lifetime. You don't get to enjoy it after my death. Maybe redemption should apply after all. Okay, that's um, involuntary discipline. Let me give you some examples that might be a change in form on this. Alright. My will. I leave Black Acre, a piece of property that I own, to you. And before I die, I sell Black Acre and I take the proceeds and I buy White Acre. A very similar piece of property. Black Acre was a ranch, a thousand acre ranch. White Acre was a thousand acre ranch. Elsewhere in the same county. Okay? I die. You take White Acre, Black Acre is gone. You take White Acre, oh, and I leave the residuary, the, all the rest and residue of my estate to um, my beloved alma mater, Texas A&M University. You take White Acre, or does A&M take White Acre? Has, has, it, has it been involuntarily parted with? No. Can we classify it as anything other than a specific request? Yeah. My will, I'll do it. My will is silent. Is it anything other than a specific request? No. Has it changed in form only? That's the argument you would make when you lose. That, that's classic. Oh, each, each piece of property is unique. See the uh, Rogers case, right? Each piece of property is unique. It's not just a change in form only. It's one piece of property to a different, unique piece of property. You take nothing, and it goes to uh, Texas A&M University, my residuary device. Okay? So far, so good. Now I'm going to change this. Here's one that I think is a change in form only, and I've sometimes asked this on the final exam, and I asked it in a short answer, and I've actually given credit for people who say it's not a change in form only if they can make a good explanation, okay? Um, but I think it's a change in form only, and I've changed my hypo to, I think, make it clear. Okay. I, my will says Black Acre to you. I own Black Acre at the time I make my will. But as part of my estate plan, Later on, after making my will, um, not too much later, not after I die, but, but six months or a year later, I decide to go through a series of transactions, or let's just make it easy. 
one transaction. I know you're going to say the, um, the, the, the Rogers case I went through a series of transactions. One transaction. So what I do is I transfer Blackacre for estate planning purposes or tax purposes to a corporation. And I own 100% of the stock in the corporation. I own 100% of the stock in the corporation, and the corporation wholly owns Blackacre. Then I die. My will is silent. I left Black Acre to you in the will. Do you take the stock that owns 100% of Black Acre, or do you take nothing? Is that a change in form only for a very limited purpose, or do you take nothing as a gift to you? My will says nothing. We can't classify it as anything other than a specific gift. It's certainly not an involuntary disposition of the property. Change in form only. I think it's a change in form only. And that's kind of a classic example. I think a lot of commentators think that that's a change in form only. So if you see that on the final exam, that's a change in form only. But you can make an argument, wait a second, it went from real property to stock, but I still owned 100% of the stock. I, plan, I, I, I still control, I controlled Black Acre before, I still control Black Acre now. It's just there's an extra layer of ownership in Black Acre, and I did that for tax purposes or estate planning purposes for a very specific purpose. It's a change in form only. I, I really do think it's a change in form only. The courts tend to be, rarely tend to apply this exception. They tend to be very skeptical about so-called changes in form. I don't know. I think the Rogers case, where, where he had an undivided interest in seven pieces of the property, and when it was all said and done, he had a 100% interest in two pieces of the property, same pieces of the property, back and forth with family members. I kind of thought that was a pretty good argument that it was a change in form only. You see how skeptical courts are, how narrowly they apply that exception. So I mean, that's my best guess from what I just gave you to a change in form only. No. Um, okay, let me let me see. We still got five minutes. You owe me like ten or fifteen minutes. Can't we? No, 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 no. no. You, we'll get this. I want to, I want to try to get through the rest of these notes on pages one forty eight and one forty nine so we at least can finish redemption tonight. Um, note seven. Perla executed a will commanding her executor to sell her real property, pay her debt, and then distribute the remaining proceeds, whatever's left, to her beneficiary. Before she died, she sold her real property. If the proceeds of the sale are an identifiable part of her real estate, right before she died, she sold all of her real property for a million dollars, and she dies, and there's a million dollars right in the bank that we can trace to the sale. Does the gift to the main beneficiaries deem, in other words, is, well, I'll just, I'll just say, has redemption occurred, or do the, um, so that the residuary beneficiaries take that million dollars, or do they, those main beneficiaries, who are going to take a real property, do they take that million dollars? Um, you know what the case held? Anyone pull up the case? Held, redemption does not apply here, because testator has made it clear in her will. The court said testator made it clear in her will that the main beneficiaries are going to take the proceeds of the sale in any event, because she directed her executor to sell the real property and then distribute the proceeds. So that's what she wanted. Held, redemption doesn't apply. In effect, the testator has made her attention clear, draft around redemption. Um, okay. <laughs> um, fine. Um, great. I'm not so convinced that so quick. Because after all, um, she wanted her executor to sell um, her real property at her death and distribute the proceeds to these beneficiaries. She sold them, not her executor. She sold them. She disposed of them. I think if the will is otherwise silent, you can make an argument. She changed her mind. She didn't want these people to have the, the property after all. She, because if she did, the executor would sell it and give them the proceeds. She sold it herself. Um, but the court was actually fairly liberal there and said the redemption doctrine had been drafted around in note seven. I, I, I see it. I see it. Maybe I think the court got the case right, but um, I don't think it's quite as clear and as easy a case as the court um, as the court made it out to be. Um, no doubt. Skip it. Don't worry about it. Um, Hell, redemption didn't apply under those facts. The stock had been paid for, but I'm not going to ask you that particular question. Um, note 10. I'm going to come back to note 9 in just a moment, and I think I can do it in two minutes. I know you're skeptical. Uh, note 10, how can you use your knowledge of the exemption rules to prepare a better estate plan for your client? I think that's what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes, including page 471 of the case book, which is uh, section 4A of the, uh, of the sample will, which says, in case that item isn't in my, in my estate at the time of my death, then blank. Okay. 
tell you what's best way to walk the sun with that. Um, note 9. Would the following gifts be subject to exemption if the shares of XYZ Corporation stock were not in testator's estate at the time of testator's death? And let's assume there are no shares of any corporation. It's not that it's merged or anything like that. We've got other, we've got other rules that we'll talk about later. But there are just no shares of any corporation in testator's estate that's traceable to XYZ stock in testator's death. Um, I give 50 shares of XYZ Corporation stock to Q. Ademption applies? No, ademption doesn't apply. Why not? Not it's a general request. That's right. It's 50 shares worth, whatever that, whatever that's worth. That's a general request. I think exemption doesn't apply. I think the testator, I think the executor, the testator of the state has to go out and get 50 shares of XYZ Corporation and give it to Q. Two, I give my 50 shares of XYZ Corporation stock to Q, and I'll tell you this. I'm going to make it easier or harder, depending on how you see it. Testator at one time did have 50 shares of stock, and it's not there anymore. You don't know where the proceeds are. It's just not there anymore. My 50 shares, what do you think? Redemption applies? I think redemption applies there. I think that's specific enough, a specific enough request. It's not, I get 50 shares payable from the source. It's not general, I get 50 shares worth. I get my 50 shares. I think that's probably specific enough if we can show that testator did have 50. And C is really clear. I give stock certificate number blank of XYZ Corporation Q. That's not there anymore. That's clearly a specific request. Redemption clearly applies to it. Um, there's no XYZ Corporation stock. It also says C. O'Neill versus Alford, page 158. We will cover that case um, next time. Yes, we'll cover that case next time on page 158. There's some special, there's some other special rules that apply to stocks and statutory rules. Um, thank you. I'm over 30 seconds. We'll begin with satisfaction. We can't get no satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Negative. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. This will be the quiz at the beginning of next class is what is redemption. <laughs>